From the campus studios of Saarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Hi, dear listeners, and welcome to another episode of Ropecast. And hello, Roger. How are you doing? Okay, Peter. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Yeah. You know, I nearly tripped coming onto campus to get here. Did you? The ground has been turned over by... What well, I can only think are wild boar. Uh, yeah, that's been a problem on campus, in fact. Yeah, they... Why are there so many of them? Why don't they do something about it? Well, I guess uh, there aren't enough gamekeepers or huntsmen uh, to go around to, well, to shoot those who are, uh, to, to shoot the boars. Who... So they have to be shot? Yeah, they have to be shot, yeah. If there are too many in a forest, there are huntsmen who uh, have the right to shoot them. Oh, yeah. But not here on campus. No, but nearby. As oh. you know, the campus is surrounded by a forest. And, of course, all these gamekeepers or huntsmen, they have to obtain a permit yeah. to shoot game in a forest because that's a very, very dangerous thing. You can easily shoot a person. Well, right? yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, so that's heavily controlled in Germany. Much unlike the U.S., I'm telling you. You have a story there? <laughs> well, yeah. Quite a few years ago, I was in the U.S., and I borrowed a four-wheeler, you know, one of those quad bikes? Oh, yeah. And I went through the forest on that, and a forest that I didn't know, but I had a dog with me who led the way. It was sort of <laughs> like Lassie, right? <laughs> but the guy who lent me the four-wheeler told me, Peter, just you be careful... If you get near the premises of a certain neighbor, he might shoot you for trespassing. He's been known to do that. Just shoot you for no <laughs> yeah. other reason? With no warning, wow. he said. Yeah, and, and this is in the forest? In the forest. And, of course, you don't have a line drawn between so no two fence. properties, no. no fence. No, this was a real forest. Yeah. So I thought to myself, I hope the dog knows the way <laughs> past those <laughs> that property. Yeah. And I asked, well, but he can't just do that. I mean, he's at least got to warn me. And he said, well, not for very long. You're on his premises and you're trespassing and he can actually shoot you and get away with that. Well, that's a um, completely different attitude in the United States, isn't it? Um, you know, the uh, right to bear arms is... Uh, right. That's even in their, uh, what is it, constitution? It's one of the amendments to the Constitution, isn't right. it? Right, yeah. uh-huh. And quite, um, quite a long way back to the early days of the United States. It's one of the first amendments, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Not the first amendment, but one of the first, I believe. And despite all of the mass killings in the United States, nothing has changed. So it's the... People talk about gun culture, don't they? Uh, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of embedded in the American culture, although I think that might be a myth that has been created by uh, the National Rifle Association oh, yes, who just want to sell their guns. Yeah. Actually, there was a recently published book which suggests that the American love of guns was actually something that was deliberately created by the manufacturers of weapons. And mm -hmm. They wanted, of course, they wanted to sell their guns mm -hmm. in big numbers, and they were looking for an alternative to selling to the army because mm -hmm. the army would be a good market in times of war and of much less good at other times. Uh -huh. So they were looking to sell to the general public, including women, incidentally. They were advertising to encourage women to, to buy weapons as well. Okay. I mean, and children. I saw that. I saw ads for children, you know, give your kid, usually the boys though, but give your kid a gun for Christmas. Oh, yeah. Let him own his own real Winchester. Yeah. I mean, give now, me a Winchester, break. Winchester, um, he was the man who actually turned gun making from a, a master craft oh. into an industry. He actually industrialized it okay. in his plant in, uh, where was that, Connecticut somewhere, I think? Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, so that was the Winchester. And the other one is uh, Smith & Wesson. Smith & Wesson. With re revolvers. Right. And they right. too... Um, Although wanted... revolvers were invented by a certain Mr. Colt, right? Weren't I they? suppose so. Yeah. yeah, as a Samuel Colt, I believe. Right. We've got to look that up. Uh -huh. But, of course, this is all America. Yeah. I believe Great Britain is completely different, isn't it? Although, you know, we always tend to say there is this sort of Anglo-Saxon culture <laughs> that America 
or the U.S. and Great Britain share. Yeah. But here, that's completely different, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, hunting in Britain would be a minority pastime anyway. And the first thing that comes to mind is hunting on horses mm -hmm. with dogs for foxes, perhaps something else as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's really a, a small minority. What about the police? I think they're, well, they're armed, but not with guns, are they? Very few have guns, you know, and they're the specially trained police officers, not the majority. And I think they've got um, two levels of training. There are things called authorized firearms officers, mm -hmm. uh, and then there are specialist firearms officers who are really well trained, and they, they are called on in emergency situations. You know, if there were a hostage crisis or some kind of so-called terrorist attack, then these people have to be called on, and the weapons are then released for use. So it's a little bit of a delay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's completely different uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, but aren't there any calls with the terrorist threats sort of looming over Europe these days for giving more firearms to policemen or maybe even into private hands? Not the latter. I think there are moves to increase the numbers of trained police officers that is trained to use firearms. Mm -hmm. But I, among the general public, I don't think there's a feeling that we need to arm all the police. And many police officers themselves don't want firearms routinely. Why is Because they think then that criminals will also routinely use firearms in their crimes. That makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. And, well, we don't get political on this show very often, but in that case, I, I would venture to say... I hope the Brits will just stay that way and not become <laughs> like the Americans. Although, mm. folks, I like the Americans a lot, but I think gun laws in the U.S. are just outrageous. Yeah. Coming back to Germany, though, I discovered quite by chance that German police officers are not only armed when they're on duty, but when off duty, they can keep their official arms with them. They don't have to hand them in uh -huh. when they go off duty, which is strange to me. Uh, uh, because that you sort of separate professional life and professional duty and private life. Yeah, being on duty or off duty seems to me a big difference, but uh, in terms of carrying your weapon, uh, it's all the same. Makes sense to me. Actually, I didn't know that. <laughs> You're telling me something about Germany here. Well, um, I've been here a while. <laughs> <laughs> true enough. Well, I guess our time's up, so uh, let's just hope we'll stay in a safe place. Yes. <laughs> and for all of you out there, too. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to Ropecast, brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial. Mm -hmm.